Hi guys, just before we start the episode today, whatever platform you are listening to this on, whether it be on the podcast, uh, Apple podcast, YouTube, whatever it is, please support it. Please like, subscribe, whatever you can do. We want to reach as many people as possible. So please do that and we'll get right into the episode. Welcome to another episode of the Chronic Comeback Podcast. Today, I'm really excited and happy to have on the show Robert Gene Smith. Uh, now, just to give you a bit of an introduction to Robert, he is the CEO of Skills to Change Institute. He is a speaker in the movie Emotion and is the creator of Faster EFT, which I know a lot of you guys have heard of. Uh, I know I've seen in a lot of comments on YouTube. Um, he's considered one of the uh, world's top neuroplasticians and behavioral engineers in the world. Um, Robert's discoveries, insights, research, and ability to understand the human brain because um, is like world renowned and he's become an expert in new neuroplasticity. He has taught thousands of people from all walks of life how to use the brain's natural way to neurologically update unpleasant me memories as a result of uh, that they are living better and healthier lives, which I know all of us listening to this, you know, are mm. desperate to do. Uh, here's a proven method to shift and change post-traumatic stress disorder, anxiety, depression, phobias, autoimmune diseases, pain, stress, and too many more to mention here. So we'll, we'll, we'll get into it. But thank you so much for, for coming on the show, Robert. How, how are you doing? I'm doing great. Excited to be here and excited to share what I have knowledge about and maybe help somebody improve the quality of their life. Awesome. Um, so could you just t tell us a little bit, I, I read up a little bit on you and um, I, someone, I guess people come to this kind of work through quite often through maybe their own struggle and their own story. Was there something mm -hmm. you need to figure out in yourself? Yeah. And I mean, yourself? yeah, I mean, I started out, I mean, um, you know, you know, the, the model of the world is basically we all start somewhere. And before we arrive, before we're born, the environment is already there. And so uh, my mother at 14 ran away from home. She got pregnant, gave birth to me when she was 15. Uh, bastard child, didn't know who my father was. My stepdad came in my life when I was about six months old. And of course, I'm the oldest of six. So uh, growing up, you know, my stepdad, which is my dad, that's all I've ever known. Um, he had emotional issues. He had anger issues and so it was, uh, you know, I had a lot of trauma with that. And then, and around when I was 14, 14 years old, my brother and I, we went to Louisiana to work for my aunt and uncle roofing for the summer. And I noticed something I liked, and that is it's peaceful. I didn't feel scared. I didn't feel like somebody's going to hurt you. And so when I went back home, I said, mom, I don't want to live here anymore. I want to go back to Louisiana uh, to live with my aunt and uncle because there's a better place. So she said, well, you can't, I'll let you move in with my grandmother. Now, of course, my grandmother was 32 when I was born. So she took me on and she raised me. I know it's crazy. <laughs> so I'm 36 and that's crazy. Wow. Yeah, that's, yeah. So she read and she always wanted me. Now, the interesting thing is, when, of course, my mom, she's passed a couple of years ago, several years ago. Uh, you would, in, the two would interact like they were sisters, you know, they'd argue and they have their little thing, you know? And so there was always like this jealousy conflict, but Anyway, mom would let grandma have me until that point. So I moved in grandma. But the weird thing is I started having these nightmares, nightmares. And, and you know, because I had a trauma, childhood trauma, even though I had the best childhood I ever had. But the problem was it wasn't perfect. There's a lot of conflict and stuff. So um, I'd have these nightmares and I'd have this nightmare where I killed my father and I killed some old lady I didn't know. And in my nightmare, I go, well, it's just really troublesome. So um. You know, my grandmother, she's very Christian because I'm in America and I'm Oklahoma. You know, it's, it's more churches than there are uh, gas stations and grocery stores here. So um, so she kind of tricked me to get me to go to church. And she said, I'll let you drive the car. And of course, you know, 15, you want to learn how to drive the car. So I'm driving a car back and forth. And I did what they said and it didn't work. You know, I still was tormented. And of course, then, um, you know, at that time, I was I was on a search to solve my problems because I did not like this. And so uh, I saw a, a, a commercial on TV and about psychology today, you know, and it's an encyclopedia series. So I said, Grandma, I want that. And of course, you know, here I'm the only child now, you know, I can sleep with my own room. I didn't have to share it with three others. And so she ordered this. And of course, I'm reading, trying to figure out why am I screwed up, really? 
and having these nightmares. And, and of course, I, there's one book and it's called The Erogenosomes, a sexuality book. And of course, I'm 15. Girls are on the radar. So I read Erogenosomes and I want to know more about this. So I went to a bookstore one time, a used bookstore, and I saw it, the book, Erogenosomes. So I bought this paperback book, paper book paperback book and I bought it and I put a brown paper bag. I went to my bedroom, locked the door and I'm going to read this. But come to find out it wasn't your erogenous zones. It was your erronea zones by Wayne Dyer. I'm telling you that and I got chills going through me. That book started changing the angle and how I perceive myself. Wow. So now I started looking at the mind. I started looking at this and then I, I thought, well, hypnosis. So I studied about hypnosis. I started anything at around 15 years old. And of course, you know, going to the church, I thought, man, they don't know what they're talking about because it didn't work. So I actually started studying the Bible myself. Uh, now, what I do is not affiliated with any religion. It's very, very mechanical. It's one plus one is two. You do this, you get that. It works that way. But this is my journey. And so that's how I started. I had nightmares and I, I still had problems for many years. And uh, of course, when I was uh, 22, I got married. My wife, before we got married, she said she was sexually abused by her father. And of course, I don't know what to do with that. And then around 18 years in the marriage, that stuff started bubbling up and it started causing conflicts. And it happened to be an emotional trigger because when she was started being abused, it was the same age my daughter turned. And that's when the stuff started coming up. Wow. I said, we need help. So I started, you know, I was still a searcher. Uh, and so I would, you know, we'd go to garage sales and I'd buy a tape series by Anthony Robbins or Unlimited Power. And that really shifted my perception about the world it says it's mental mechanics. So I started in the early, early 90s. Just I listened to this stuff all the time. And so I got to that point. I started to understand mental mechanics and then I wanted to get trained in NLP. And of course, my whole purpose was not only to say help my life, but to actually if I could fix her, fix this stuff that's going on, my life will get better. Our life will get better. And so then I wanted to get trained in, in, in NLP and I found someone locally, $2,500. It might as well be 25 million. I mean, we didn't have money. And so uh, he sent me a VHS tape and I watched it. And I said, can I talk to one of your students? I talked to this woman telling her what my life is and what kind of things are going on. She said, there's a guy on in the internet uh, it's, it's emofree.com, which is Gary Craig's EFT. All right. So I bought the course. I sat around, I started using it. Now, uh, of course, every belief system, whether it's a mechanical, uh, medical, psychological, um, EFT, um, any healing modality has what we would call a belief system. Now that belief system will say you will heal or you won't heal or how fast you will heal. Well, the problem with the EFT model is their system is based on energy, blocked energy. I already knew because of all my, my study about the mind and how the mind process information, it's not blocked energy. And so my number one premise of what I work with is that you're not broken. There's nothing wrong with you. And you're successfully creating your illness, your physical problems, your emotional issues, your financial issues, whatever it is. Your brain is a manifester. So it'll bring in information, it'll organize it across the cortices, and then it'll just start pumping it out. And so that's how I got started. Now, I'm a public speaker. I would never in a million years ever believe, and I'd speak publicly ever. I'm not in school, horrible fear of public speaking, very shy, very withdrawn because of my childhood. But by using something that actually works is basically changing and updating my memories it changes my personality. It changes my value system. It changes my body. So that's how I got started. I wanted to figure out how to solve my problem. And then of course, I started wanting to help my family. Awesome. And um, thank you for that introduction. I think that makes, I think that like resonates with probably a lot of people. Uh, I mean, sounds like, yeah, you had a, a crazy, crazy yeah, upbringing, uh, but then, you know, to, you know, to do what you're doing now, helping so many people. That's just amazing. Um, could we, um, if we could, I guess, focus more on the, I know you deal with a lot of different people from a lot of different issues. If we could focus mm -hmm. a little more on the, the chronic health side of things. Mm -hmm. When when someone comes to you with, you know, a, 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 a chronic health issue, is there always some trauma to 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 fix, uh, to, to address? Is there always yeah. some trauma? 
Well, let, let's we, we can't we can't use the word always. There's always a variable. OK, yeah. But yeah. let me just say this. What, what is the purpose of pain? The purpose of pain from your brain is one is to keep you safe. So uh, like, for example, I was in Hawaii. I was I was I was a volunteering at a drug rehab and the the uh, CEO of the company, uh, uh, he had he's limping around. And I asked Jeff, which is the director, I said, hey, what's what's the deal with him? He said, oh, he you know, he was um, out dirt bike riding and he hurt himself. And I said, I wonder if you'd let me help him. So I go up and I say, hey, um, you know, how are you doing? I say, would you like some help with uh, with your pain in your leg? He goes, yeah, sure. I said, um, OK, so how'd you hurt yourself? He said, you know, I'm riding a dirt bike and I go over and I land and I crash. Now, by the way, he can't hardly walk at all. He's got a little crutch thing with him. So. I said, okay, so you hurt you. So, so here it is. So in the memory, and by the way, anybody who's ever been hurt, who ever hurt themselves, their brain is actually holding on to the memory of pain. And so uh, I said, okay, so, so I started addressing the memory. So one of the biggest things that was a major problem is that he's laying down there on the ground and he's just waiting for the next motorcycle to come on top of him. Cause he's right there in the middle of it. Boom. Next thing you know. So I started working on this. I started addressing his fear, dressing his guilt and his, all this stuff just mentally. And then I go into your mind and said, now in your mind, you have pain, right? So we go and address the memory of pain and we, and we adjust the pain where it's not in the mind. And then I said, okay, won't you stand up and see what your pain level? And by the way, before we start, it's a zero to 10, it's a 10 in less than 30 minutes. He's standing up on it. And the pain level is like a three. Now I hadn't even worked on the pain. I just worked on memory. Mm. So then we start working on the pain. And when he, when I walk out, he has no pain. He's walking around and he's been walking like this for six weeks. Now, the reason why the brain holds on to pain is trying to keep you safe. Now, is that a real trauma? Well, it's an accident, mm. you know, but the weird thing is the brain is what we call the first green machine. That means it recycles experiences over and over again. Now, I work with a lot of people who have had, severe traumas. I have a lot of people who have fibromyalgia, you know, me, Hashimoto's disease, lupus. And all we do is make adjustments in their past. Now, scientifically proven that people who are diagnosed with cancer, they can back up up to 18 months, a major emotional trauma. So an emotional trauma happens emotionally, but what are emotions? Emotions are from the brain down to the body and it seems real and it feels real. It depresses you. It puts you heavy on you. You're always scared about something, you know, and so it perpetuates. So as we go and we start cleaning memories and adjusting memories, and if you ever watch any of my videos, you go to YouTube, Healing Magic, or you can type in Faster of Tea or Robert Gene Smith, and you'll find these. And you go to and you, and you notice that people will tell you exactly how they heal themselves. One, they address their hurts and their pains, their fears, their traumas. And the weird thing is like um, what happens is the brain will recycle your childhood. Let's say, for example, you had an emotional, crazy childhood. You had a big brother that beat you up or you had an alcoholic father or a crazy psychotic mother and you never know when you're going to get hit. So the emotional environment is thick. Now you want to get out of there. So the first first marry, first guy that would marry you or the first way to go to school and get out. So your brain already has been programmed. This is how the world is. And now you go to work, go to school, and your brain is going to look for the same emotional pattern. Either it's going to find bosses that will pick on you or colleagues or better yet, the emotions in the air. It could be wavelengths. It could be smells. It could be anything. And then you're still following into the same footsteps that I'm a victim. I'm not, the world's not safe. And it's and the weird thing is the conscious mind, we think, oh my God, I got this pain. Uh, I could die. I wonder how bad could I get? And so in our mind, we start to manifest our fear. And the more we practice the fear, the bigger it gets. And the bigger it gets, the more it becomes a reality. You know, we had Rose Hartgrove who, who had lupus for like, I don't know, for many, many years. And of course, I'm going to Las Vegas and I'm doing a seminar. It's a, you can change yourself. Basically, the biggest problem in the healing modality world is they don't know how to work on themselves. So I create a system, show you how to change yourself. 
Now, this woman was a psychiatric nurse. She had emotions out the wazoo, lots of emotional traumas. And she comes to Vegas. And of course, she's in a wheelchair, right? And uh, blood tested lupus there. And so she's asking questions and you know, she's emotionally sensitive and she wanted me to do a session on her and I couldn't do a session. I, I had too much stuff going on. I didn't have time, but to give to her cause, I hired two of my upper level practitioners. I said, go in there and address this, this, and this, because you can hear the story. You can hear her trauma. You can hear her rejections, whatever this is and her badge of honor of lupus. And when she rolled out of that session, two hours later, she said, I noticed my lupus systems are gone, are lessened, not gone. Now, this was in October. Now, I do another level one. She took a level one then, another level one in Oklahoma in February. And, and of course, um, there was a guy named uh, Fritz Miller who, who financially supported her. He, he, he did sessions on her, helped her. And he said, are you going to Oklahoma? He says, no, I've already been level one. He said, you need to go to Oklahoma or I'm not going to be your friend. And of course, <laughs> of course, he helped pay for it to get her to Oklahoma. So she's retaking this because, again, this is so rich about how the mind works. And then while she's in, now this time, she's not in a wheelchair. She's actually walking without crutches, without a wheelchair. And she's sitting there learning and doing the practices. And then her phone keeps going off. And she looks at it and it's her doctor. And of course she's in class. So when she gets out of class and he calls and said, Hey, there's no lupus in your blood system now. And that's within from, uh, let's see, let's say October to February. Wow. And, and that's by working and addressing memories. Now this is test. This is proof. We have, we have proof of all of this. Mm. So this is how the brain works. What do you say to someone who's listening to this right now who, and I'm sure you do get many people who come to you and they're like, okay, I get what you're saying that the mind has an impact, mm. but this is a real physical thing. Like I've, you know, I, I had, uh, I, you know, I got an infection from, you know, a tick bite. I got Lyme disease that, you know, right. I, I was in a mold. I was in a mold infested place. Um, and, you know, it's, it's that that's causing it. What, what do you say to people who say that? Well, I, again, I have, I, I can't say a hundred people who had, who had Lyme disease, who had POTS disease, who had all these different diseases. They don't have it now. Mm -hmm. And the same thing is uh, again, blood tested lupus there. It physically was there. Blood tested mm -hmm. lupus, not physically there. Hashimoto's disease physically was there documented and gone. Uh, Paul came to my office. Now, Paul, he had 13 angiograms where they went into his growing up to his brain and put uh, 13 stents in his up there. And so he comes to my office and he says, you know, I want to, I want you to help me with, I stop smoking and this and that. And so I addressed stop smoking and all this stuff. And also I wanted to address his pain. Now he has to have morphine patches. Now this is a real documented doctor proven nerve damage there. So I work on that and I work on the pain. I work on the emotional event with the doctors, his divorce was very angry and all this other stuff. Now I just address the emotions and then I go to the doctors and go to the pain and all the stuff. And when he walked out, he had no pain. And that's in two hours. All right. By, and I, I worked on a lot of memories and all that stuff. I could change a lot of memories in a short, short period of time, or I help you change it. And so then he comes back about six weeks later and he has this big stack of papers and he goes, look, doctor says I'm supposed to have nerve damage the rest of my life. Where's it at? I said, the doctor's got it now. You're free. <laughs> we changed it. See the brain and, and even scientifically proven. I mean, you know, John Sornos and other people talk about how scientifically the brain has the power to heal itself. It's called placebo. Unfortunately, when you hear the word placebo, it means fake from a doctor who says, well, this freaking placebo is ruining our research. But they don't realize placebo is the mind's great ability to heal itself mm. internally by how it processes information, even if it's a fake drug or a fake operation. Yeah. Nocebo means you're getting the right drug, the right operation, and they still are not healed because in their brain, they're actually doing something to maintain illness. Yeah. And that's the difference. It's what you're doing inside and how you're processing and what you do. We call it the universal pattern of creation and or belief. We do it all the time. We manifest all kinds of stuff with our thoughts. And how similar is it? Because we've had a lot of people on the show uh, who have healed through brain retraining. Um, mm -hmm. They identified they had you know, limbic system dysfunction where, you know, their whole nervous system is constantly in, in a fight or flight. 
is mm-hmm. it, is, it uh, is this like an overlapping of that? Is like, do you talk about well, the different system? <laughs> well, the, here's a problem with some of those systems. First of all, be positive, be positive, be positive. All right, so try to do the positive thing. Nothing wrong with that. But here's the problem. If you have trauma in your mind and you have a childhood trauma or you have a belief in, in trauma, whatever it is, or experience, you know, like the like the four-year-old little kid, mom puts her in a cab, they go to the hospital, not even knowing where they're going. It's a total surprise. They take her to the hospital. They walk her in, not even know where she's at, what she does. She's only four. And next thing you know, the nurse grabs her, straps her down to a, hos- a, a, a gurney, and they take her in. And they and she feels like somebody's trying to kill her. And they put this mask over. And so this is a trauma for a child. Now she's in her 50s or 60s. That trauma, even though some people say, well, it's not really trauma, it has created a value system that life in the world is not safe. So if they start there, then they're going to take this world is not safe everywhere. That means sounds, sensations, chemicals, looks, people, and they and it injects. Now, the, the limbic system is not broken. Your anxiety is not broken. Your worry is not broken. It's designed to keep you safe based on an emotional reference. Mm. So if you change the emotional reference, now, by the way, you could have, it could be something as simple as the little girl who falls off the swing and knocks her front teeth out. And from that point forward, she made a decision that she's ugly and no one likes her. And from that one single event, she'll build a whole entire life on something like that. And then it'll be replicated over and over again. So I'm, I'm going to ask a question based on myself now, because I'm, you know, the one here that's here. Um, so I'm, me, because I've, I've talked, I, I've spoke to so many practitioners over the years, and they always mention trauma to me. And I always say, and we talked a little bit about it before we started recording, I always say that I hadn't really, uh, until getting, um, like, ill, uh, or until getting, like, it, it, the issues that I have, I hadn't had that much trauma in my life. And actually, I think the most trauma I've had is since that point, which inevitably then creates a little bit of a, you know, you, as I think, as you said, because I then worry about getting worse, I create more of that and create more oh, of yeah. that. Um, yeah. And it's this vicious cycle. I think that's probably why people start out with <laughs> disease and then it's this whole list of other stuff. Because I'm someone who doesn't see themselves as having like trauma in their childhood, mm-hmm. um, could I, I, I'm assuming I could be wrong about that. Just, it could be a small thing, as you said, I think before yeah. we started recording my brother being a bit of a bully, some stuff like that. Yeah. yeah see, you have to understand it, it could be anything. I mean, to a child, you have to understand to a child here it is. Let's say you, uh, yeah. you, you, how, how much older was your brother? Seven years older. All right. Seven years old. So that's a big difference. So here it is. You got this brother, you look up to him. He's mean to you. He picks on you, punches in your arm. He does all these things to you. As a child, what is that? What kind of world does that create for you? Here it is: is someone you love, and now they're beating up on you. They're 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 physically hurting you, and it creates an idea about the world isn't safe for me. Maybe you know, it depends on how you see it. And now this is an imprint, an imprinted idea. And so now you leave home, all right? Now you leave home, and you have this. This is your model of the world. So now you're going to look. Where is my? Who's going to punch me now? So then who's going to punch you? Well, it's got to be somebody's going to punch me because, I, you know, this is my brother. I love my brother, but yet he's mean to me. And then you'll grow up and you'll find it. It's like it's like uh, if you've been raised up in an angry environment, you grow up to be angry, you know, and you find people who are angry. So your brain is actually replicating this. And so, you know, the 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 Indian burn or the punch in your arm. And now the punch in your arm is a, you know, is a, is a fibromyalgia or it's a, a something else like that. It could be a multitude of things. I've had people who are so, I mean, I, I have tons and tons of real testimonials all for over the years. I mean, you can go look at them, you tell they're real. They're not paid actors, you know. These are real people with real stuff, and you can see their whole story. You can watch them all through their years and how they, over 10 years, are still healthy. So yeah. the problem is, is the brain recycles misery. And to the brain, now you have to understand, to the limbic brain, misery is not misery. This is how the world is, mm. all right? To the brain, to the limbic operating system, it's just normal. It doesn't judge it bad or good. We call the, the unconscious or the limbic system is an intelligent idiot. That means if you teach it how to use a knife, it'll try to cut everything up. 
and it'll replicate, replicate, replicate until you consciously, prefrontal cortex, take control of the unconscious. And so one of the things we do is say, learn how to know your unconscious. You know, like the woman said, you know, um, I shouldn't have pain. I mean, I, I hit black ice, I hit the bridge and I had an accident and I have all this pain. She says, it's like when I blink, it's been like you're walking on glass. It hurts just the blink. Even my eyelashes hurt. That's how bad it is. I went through therapy and the pain should be gone. But the problem is logic, common logic doesn't fix unconscious programming. It doesn't change memories. And so when, when we went in and I had her go in, now she's taken like, I can't tell you how many, uh, there's a testimony out there. Her name is, um, I think, Kathy or Patty. And she said, you know, I'm taking X amount of pills every day to deal with my pain. And ever since I started, and she came to my weight loss program to lose weight because it's really not about losing weight. It's about taking control of your mind. Weight, the best way to lose weight is not try to lose weight and change your relationship with yourself and other people and food. So here it is. She come to this and she's learned how to do this and she got rid of her pain. Now, how did she do that? She started addressing the trauma and the pain and the anger and the frustrations that occurred because of all this stuff and the helplessness and no control. And just like you said, um, what I say, worry or fear is an affirmation. So you know what you have? You wake up in the morning and you go, God, I hope it's not going to be horrible today. And then you imagine horribleness or you imagine your pain. So what you're doing now is, in, and we call it NLP, future pacing. You're rehearsing it and you're building it and you're planning it and you won't be disappointed because you've already programmed yourself. It's a concept is what you do before you do affects what you do. And if you don't know how to change the reasons, which is the emotional drivers and the internal representations, the brain will replicate, you know, and the, the key, the true key is, is truly changing memory, updating memory. Now, scientifically, the brain always updates memories. It always changes memories. Every time you visit it, you can make a memory worse by merely feeling bad and thinking about the original bad event and it gets worse, or you can do the opposite. So this is how it works. So it, mechanically, you can change just about anything because scientifically proven, the placebo has performed sometimes better than the real drug because of what the individual is doing in their mind. It's not the sugar pill. It's not the fake operation. It's internally images in their mind and what they're affirming and what they're practicing, what they're doing within. And if you want to get worse, all you do is think about worse things. Hang around people who are really sick. You can improve the quality of your sickness. Yeah. So, so, so what, what do you, why do some people like myself who relatively has had less trauma compared to someone, you know, I know people mm -hmm. who had parents who've died mm -hmm. like at a young age and mm -hmm. they are, you know, they don't have chronic health issues. Why do right. some people get sick? and other people don't, even though maybe they have supposedly less trauma. And the, the, one of the most important things about why is you can have five people go to the same movie. They watch the exact same movie. They have five different stories. Hmm. And for somebody who has a trauma, like that brother punches them in the arm. Now, what they will think about, they will focus on the physical pain. They will notice the pain and they will... Uh, intensify the pain. And the other person, they'll look at his face. They'll notice his face or they hear his tone. So it's amount of focus that makes a difference. Like some people, you know, they will have visual things that scare them and other people have kinesthetic things that scare them or auditory things. So it all depends on what they focus and also what they play in their mind. Right. Okay. That's the difference. Okay. Some people just roll it off and just ignore it and move on. It doesn't mean it's gone because it could come back later. Okay. Neurologically. So, so it could just manifest in a different way uh, it, at some well, point. Uh, well, not that it manifests. The, the receiver focuses on different parts. Okay. Okay. So again, again, it's what they choose to focus on and what's important to their inner processing of the information. Um, the, another question I had, I, I so I actually did a course, an NLP course last year because um, mm -hmm. I was, I was interested in, you know, helping me with these kinds of things. And um, I don't think the practitioner was amazing, uh, but I get she was, she was quite good. But in terms of the stuff that I found difficult and I find difficult with like brain retraining and stuff like that is, is the, 
real visualization and tapping into um, tapping into feelings of Mm -hmm. of like either past memories or future like memories to make you feel good I find that really difficult right do you do you have have you had people say that to you before uh when you're trying to do that well the, the problem with the problem with NLP trainings NLP is a great uh gateway to understanding what you're doing and a lot of NLPers the problem with NLP, it's not easy user-friendly. You know what I'm saying? It's not easy to use on yourself. Yeah. Now, what my system is, I call it, it's really faster NLP. It's a user-applied NLP. It's it's where you can actually see how to do that. I, I It's very simple to get into your memories. Remember, uh, we have when you have a trauma, now a trauma could not be a big trauma. It could be a little trauma. It could be watching a TV show about spiders and snakes. Now you got a fear of spiders and snakes. Okay, dog. So here's the deal. Um, when you have an experience, your brain will handle it three basic ways. One, you're going to respond. You're going to fight back or two, you're going to take off running and three, which is very common. You go numb and dumb. That means you feel nothing. You see nothing. And to say, stay safe, you got to keep yourself distant from the experience because if it gets too close, the emotions are too strong and you don't want to feel that way, which also makes you feel bad. The problem is if you had a lot of, physical it doesn't have to be big it could be a, a belt from your dad or it could be a, a, a medical experience or it could be anything and your brain holds on to that and just keeps replaying on you mm-hmm. so there are ways to get inside yourself but remember the reason why you don't want to feel it is because you don't want to feel it and right. your brain has mechanisms inside of itself to distance yourself now i will say this people who are physically ill they said, I'd rather you beat me with a stick than taunt me emotionally. So they would rather run from their emotions and not deal with it and try to do the fairyland and the, the happy-go-lucky kumbaya massage and all this stuff. And hopefully the stuff goes away. It doesn't. But if you go to the stuff and you annihilate it, update it, change it where it doesn't bother you, you're free. And you can never make it bother you again if you finished it. How quickly for someone who's been dealing with these things for sometimes years and years, how mm-hmm. quickly can uh, someone resolve something like that physically uh, with the work that you, that you do? But it, it, there's a lot of variables to this. Yeah. Uh, let's, I mean, I don't know you really. I mean, let's say for example, you have been physically beaten every from the day you were born by your brother. You nearly killed by your brother and your other brothers beat you up. You go to school and they beat you up. Uh, you've been traumatized, raped, beaten. You name the whole gamut of, of a miserableness. Yeah. Uh, you have more resources. But sometimes some people just have a single accident or they may have any medical trauma. Uh, some people will even have illnesses by watching their mother be sick and they actually take on and internally create an illness. So there's many variables of this, but one of the most important things is you got to do something different. You've got to change it. Or if you don't change it, you'll wrestle it with ever. I mean, there's some people who come some of these brain retrainings and that system does not know how to do one thing and change the original cause. So they're always going to be fighting and battling the illness because they don't know how to change the memory. Mm. And if you change the memory, you're free. Mm. And that's the biggest thing. What would you say is the biggest uh, obstacle to people getting better when they come to you? Like the, Mm -hmm. I'm assuming the hit rate is never a hundred percent, right? There's, there's always going to be people who fall beneath the cracks, uh, between the cracks. Mm -hmm. Um, Those people, why, why don't they take to it as well? Yeah. Well, it's, it's very simple. You know, I talk about Rose Hartgrove and how her lupus is gone and she was part of the lupus groups and she shared in the group say, Hey, I, I, I figured out how to get, get rid of my lupus. I'm willing to give free sessions to anybody who'd like to have this. And she said, I have never received so much hate mail in my life. They said, I wish you would die a horrible death. You never had it in the first place. Even though I had blood tests, the problem with pain Pain is linked to people. Pain is linked to survival. Pain is linked to identity. Pain is linked to value. All right. So again, remember, this is something you spend time with the whole day. Mm. You plan your whole day around this. And then somebody says, hey, you know, uh, let's see if we can get rid of your pain. And you go, right. You know, this is my best friend, even though you hate it. 
you still do it, you know? Mm. And that's the bizarreness of it all. Yeah. Which actually, it's funny you say that. I, I actually just posted an episode uh, this week and it, the title of it was, it, Are You Ready to Recover? And I said, look at the comments on my old YouTube clips and you can see the people that are ready and the people that aren't. And that's not to divide them out. It's the people that are looking for a negative in the content. And they're, uh, for example, like today, there'll be people who've been traumatized by spending so much money on courses and stuff. Mm -hmm. They'll be mm -hmm. saying, these guys are just trying to make me sign up for right. you know, your course. And, you know, right. this is all a sales pitch and stuff like that, right. rather than right. taking the positive messages from it. And I think, right. is, is, that, is that what you mean? It's more that people are just yeah, so... Yeah. Well, again, it's, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's the same, it's the same way with weight loss. Weight loss, the problem with weight loss, the exact same system. Weight loss says, so the, the systems out there, the way to lose weight is the diet and exercise or drugs, Right. The problem is weight is not the problem. Weight is a symptom. If weight were the problem, you lose it once, it's gone forever. The problem is you try all these weight loss programs, you try all these healing programs, you do it over and over again, and nothing really works. Mm -hmm. And it all comes, like weight loss, it all comes back. The problem is, is they're not changing the real cause, which is memory. Memory references, emotional ties, emotional links. Sometimes it's linked to my, my, my father, my love for my father. He was sick. I'm sick. We're sick together. It's, it's a, just a bizarre understanding. It's like the woman, she called me and she said, I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. All right. And I said, okay. So I started doing an intake on her. And of course she's been sick. I don't know how long now it's been a while for a long time. And she said, I'm constipated and all this stuff. I said, okay, so you're full of shit then. Right. She, and she could laugh. She goes, well, listen, let's just think about it. When did it start? When did you start getting sick? What is, what is the story of a sickness? And come to find out, here's the truth. Um, her mother was a nurse. Mom was always away from work. She was a latch, latch key kid. That means she comes home alone. And when she got sick, guess who was home? Her mother. Mm. She figured out if she's sick, she gets love. Now, she's in her 50s, and mom's been dead for quite some time. Now, she wants to get well. And as I started changing these memories, she said, hold on a second. If I get rid of these memories, if I start changing these memories, who will love me? Because, again, she's going to go see doctors and nurses. This is a positive feedback. Oh, by the way, this is a metaphor for mom and dad. Mm. So then I said, oh, hold on a minute. If I get sick, that means I can't get my SSI, my free money. I mean, if I get rid of my illness, that means I have to go to work. Mm. Now, another woman says, well, if I get rid of my illness, my husband will leave me because he'll lose a job. I said, hold on a second. You only give yourself two options. Sick, have a husband. Well, have no husband. There could be another option. Well, and having fun and traveling. So again, these also, illness also has its positive side effects. It has its benefits. And sometimes, you know, like one of the things we ask in the question says, who's going to lose your job? Who's going to lose a job if you're well? Who will you miss if you're no longer sick? I mean, what are you going to talk about now? The woman who came to my office and she goes, Robert, I have to be honest with you. And I said, that's a good start. She said, I've seen 14 other therapists before you. I said, well, 15 is your lucky number. Tell me exactly what you've been telling all these therapists. So I wrote down every one of these memories in that two hours. I changed those memories. That's what she can't go do anymore. Can you, can you give me an example when you say you change someone's memory? What okay. That, so what's that involved? Uh, all right. Scientifically, this is how memories work. Uh, people make memories worse by thinking. All right. So let's say, for example, um, uh, let's say, for example, uh, your, your, your father didn't pick you up for practice, right? And so you have this memory of being abandoned. Your dad doesn't love you, right? All right. So then later on, in, in, um, later on uh, your buddies are all going out. And they're going to stop by and pick you up. And they didn't show. And now you're feeling sad. And you go, oh, yeah, it's just like what my dad did. So now you're feeling sad. And you look at that memory. Your brain will take this sad feeling now. And it'll add it to that memory. So because remember, neurologically, if you think one thing and you visit something, your brain will bring those feelings into that memory and adjust the memory. 
So when I say adjust, change the memory, we actually embellish and update the memory to where it doesn't bother you anymore. As a matter of fact, you can't even remember the bad memory. All you are left with a positive memory. It's like, it's like you and I, we, let's say I met you and your name is Phil and say I met you and you're a good guy. And I talk about how great you are. And then I meet someone else and they, and I said, Oh yeah, I, I met old Phil. And he goes, Phil, you talk about that jerk that lives in Bali. I go, well, well, yeah, that Phil. So in your mind, he's, he's talking about, and he's angry and he's animate. And he's, he says all these things about you. And I'm in my mind, I'm seeing you and I'm listening to him. His emotions are up. Now, all of a sudden, my good feeling about you has now been updated with this guy's memory and how he's acting. So now I look at Phil and go, well, maybe he's not that good of a guy after all, because again, my memory has been updated about you. Now, when we go to negative memories, we do exactly the same thing. There's a process, you know, because when you go into a memory, you're actually going into what I would call a hypnotic state. You go into a happy memory, recall a happy memory. Everybody do that. Take a deep breath, close your eyes and remember a happy moment. Just do it. Think of a happy memory. As if you're right there and notice what happens when you do that. Can you feel it? Yes. This is where I do have trouble. This is what I was talking about before. I like have trouble with like. Okay. Okay. Memories. Let's, let's do this. Let's do this. So some people have, uh, uh, you do have a happy, let's go to a bad memory. See if you're better at bad memories, uh, go to a painful memory. Uh, yeah. Okay. Someone really angered you, bothered you, a bad experience. You got it. Yeah. All right. As, and can you feel it? I can feel it more for sure. Okay. So you're more talented with the bad than the good. <laughs> <laughs> no wonder why you're sick. <laughs> you got to do it the other way. All right. So by the way, I here's the point I want to make. You can go to a bad memory. And as you go to a bad memory, you feel bad. That means you go into a hypnotic state. You go to a good memory. You feel good. That's another hypnotic state. Mm. This is how the brain actually works. Mm. We go from state to state all the time. The key is updating the bad ones where they're not bad anymore. Mm. That by adding, interjecting and putting stuff in it, or we use a, a psychosensory process. We call it tapping. All it does is relax you. We use a process called defrac. That means you go into it and you come out, you feel good, and you go back in. And over and over again, it flattens out the memory where it never bothers you. You can't even make it bother you after you're done. Mm -hmm. Okay. Neurologically. For, for, for someone like me in, in that situation where I do have trouble just putting myself, this is what I was talking about earlier, putting myself in the memory, even when it was the bad memory then, I wasn't mm -hmm. like in it. I couldn't like, yeah, I, I, know, yeah. I, I know people where they're like, I can smell the, you know, yeah, yeah. I, and I can, you know, I can taste that thing. And I'm like, yeah. I can't do shit. well, you, you process your information like I do. Right. The way to get in. Uh, so I don't have good visuals like that. Yeah. But how I get to my memory and how do I get to the feelings? I talk about it. I'm okay. sitting at the kitchen. I'm sitting at the kitchen table. And as my father walks in, I see his look on his face. I start to feel it as if I'm there. Okay. So, so again, you have, you have programmed yourself to protect yourself from going there. Mm, okay. And so, so you, you have to use other avenues to get into it. So is there, there's always a way in. Cause I actually, oh, yeah. Someone, someone commented on it. Um, actually, someone sent me a, a, an email saying, if for some people, it is Im impossible. There's like a condition or something. And it's impossible. Because I know I can, it's not like, like when I close my eyes, I can see stuff, but like, it's just like not very clear. Um, yeah, yeah, so, yeah. But, but there's always a way in from your perspective. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. There's many ways. Again, the, the, the brain as, you know, like when you have a memory, the memories are spread throughout the whole, the whole brain. All right. So you have visual cortex, auditory cortex, motor cortex, et cetera, smell, it's everything. So uh, the way you access it, you have to figure out your, your combination. Like, for like, you know, I trained my practitioners and, and of course, you know, I have several working on me because I had something happen and tapping and they're going to help me. And they said, well, go back and see the picture. I said, I don't have pictures in my head. <laughs> you know, they said, so an only way for me to go to my, my, my uh, stuff, is either one heat of the moment, I change it then, and or I have to talk about it to get me into the memory. Okay. Because again, okay. so again, if you have like if you had somebody beating up on you all the time, you're gonna have to figure out some way to numb out so you won't go crazy. Yeah. And you've 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 accomplished that. And what what, what do you you replace it with a like almost like a fake memory where like well, hold, hold on, let me just pause you right here. Okay. 
all your memories in your head now are fake. Yeah, true. Oh, you got it. You got it. Again, right now is real. Everything before this moment you visit in your head is not real. Yeah. But when you visit, it feels real because the brain, the limbic operating system will send stuff to the body and make it feel real. Okay. Okay. So you're just sitting here with me and you can go visit a bad memory and feel bad. That's a hypnotic trance built from the the limbic operating system and all the data. And it's going to whoosh. You feel it to be true. I guess what I'm saying is, uh, so if I have a memory, fake or real, whatever, um, mm-hmm. and it's someone punching me in the face at school or something, and then I actually replace it with a memory of, you know, him not punching me and us, you know, mm-hmm. having a mm-hmm. good old time, and um, that's right. the kind of thing that you would do it with in that way. Yeah, let, let me explain. Let me explain your brain. Okay. First of all, uh, your brain is about six to seven pounds, right? Since you're probably from the UK, it's probably about six pounds. <laughs> Just kidding, by the way. No, but there's six or seven pounds. Now, here's the deal. Everything inside your memory, every person, every actor, every experience is only yourself. Yeah. That means your brother can't fit in your head. You will, you will see something. You'll internalize it and translate it your own way. So that means everything in you is you. That means if you go to a memory and your dad is yelling at your mom, your dad is not yelling at your mom. Mm. This is your memory for you. Mm. That means you are the dad and you're the mom in your mind. <clears throat> mm-hmm. So what the brain does, it brings in, it captures, it organizes, and it puts out. So if you understand your brain's purpose is for survival, you can watch a TV show like I did when I was in 18 years old. I watched a movie at about we drove about uh, an hour to a lake, you know, weeks later, and I'm going to swim across this lake. And I hear the theme of the movie. Dun, 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 dun. I go, oh, shit, sharks. There's no sharks in Oklahoma. But the fear was installed and I didn't know I had it by watching a TV show. I never saw a shark in my life. Mm-hmm. So you can you. So when you capture things in your mind, everything in your mind is yourself. Mm-hmm. So if you change your mind, you change memories, you're not changing the past. You can't change something that doesn't exist. What you are doing is you're changing what your brain gives back to you. So you could sit around and watch horror movies or or murder movies or scary movies or happy memories, movies, your brain will use that on you. Mm. So everything inside your memory is you. Everything inside your head is you. Yes, it did happen a long time ago, but it's not happening today. And if you replay it in your mind, who's the movie director, who's the actor, and who are all players inside your head? It's yourself. And, and, and what that's doing as well, then, I'm assuming, is it means that it's giving you a different lens to view future instances that are similar in the rest of your life, right? Yeah. Well, what it does is that if you change bad memories, you're actually tell your brain and programming your brain what you want in the future. Okay. If you replay, let, let's say, for example, uh, your mom was always sick and she talked about you're sick. You love your mom. You listen to her stories. You watch her slowly dwindle and die. And you have all those memories and you revisit those memories. You know what's going to happen to you? Your brain will use those memories on you. You'll start to feel the symptoms. You start playing the fear that you're going to die, too even though it's just a movie in your head, but you believe it to be true, true. You act like it's true. It becomes true for you. Only you Mm -hmm. memories aren't real, but they feel real and you can manifest from memory. Yeah. Memories are designed for survival and it's designed to keep you in loop of whatever you hold. So people who are listening to this right now, um, uh, there are a lot of people who listen to this who, uh, and, and I've actually, you know, been speaking, uh, people have like mess, left comments on YouTube recently, just, um, you know, who've, who've literally got no money at the moment. And obviously mm-hmm. they can't afford for, you know, big courses and stuff like that. Right. What what would what would you suggest for someone like that to do, just like in the first yeah. instance, to, with, that wouldn't cost a lot of money in the okay. first instance? Yeah. Might not have the big dramatic impact, but that would still help. Right. Them. Well, to be honest with you, uh, I'm going, uh, uh, Phyllis is one of those people who uh, chemical sensitive and her life was so bad. She couldn't, nobody could come to her home. Uh, she couldn't see her kids. Soap, smells, everything. She was locked in her home and um, she was a nurse. She actually had a lot of uh, a trauma, 
uh, as a nurse, witnessing stuff and childhood stuff. So what she did is she started watching my videos on YouTube. I have 1500 of them, lots of hours. And she actually did what I said to do in the videos. She would tap along, change along. And at one point, she in one of the videos, her, her testimony says, I called my husband and I'm crying. Robert says, I'm doing it to myself. And, and he said, well, maybe he knows what he's talking about. Now you think about it. If you play the movies in your mind, if you say bad things and you plan bad things in your head, who's doing it? If every person in your mind is yourself and you watch bad movies inside your head and you feel bad, who's doing it? And the problem is we talk like our brain is the enemy, but it's not. It's trying to save you and keep you in alignment with what you captured. If you don't like what you have, you've got to update yourself. Every seven years, your body changes. It's time to change the memories too. So it, 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 it sounds like you've got, uh, there's a whole library of free resources in YouTube. There's a lot. Yeah. Okay. Is, is it just, um, do you recommend any specific ones to get started uh, for, for people? Yeah. Well, we do have, we, we have some playlists in there. Okay. Um, there's a playlist like start here playlist. And I kind of explain how the mind works. I okay. have a lot of tap alongs. All you do is just tap along, associate, tap on yourself. Uh, I talk about how you, you're, you know, again, the two models of the world. What are the two models of the world? One, the world is doing it to me. And two, I'm responding to the world. I'm responding to my internal representations. I clearly give you enough. And so many people have written me and they said, I changed it. You changed my life. And all I did is watch YouTube. They listened to me all night long, wow. day after day. And they did it over and over again. And, and do you, so it, it, is this a, a daily practice that people need to do then and consistently throughout the day, in the morning? Uh, yeah, yeah. Let, me, let me explain what this is. Yeah. You currently have a daily practice, how you process the world, how you think about the world. When you have a problem, you do the same thing that doesn't change anything. So what I'm teaching you is how to live your life, mm -hmm. how to deal with things right now. As things happen, this is something you'll do the rest of your life because it works. It gives you personal power. It gives you control. Your self-esteem go up. Your health improves. Your, your relationships improve. This is something you'll do because it works. It's yeah. simple. Yeah. It's, it's, it's we're teaching you how to love yourself, like yourself from within yourself, because what you hold inside, you do to yourself and you do to other people. Okay. Okay. We're teaching you how to be in control of yourself. Okay, cool. Uh, I think it's just there, uh, yeah, because there's there's all these these. Uh, I'm in the brain retraining mindset of like there's like rounds and stuff to do every day. It's not like that. It's more. It's not. Listen, this is this is. I call this directed mindfulness, being directly in control of your mind. We're not trying to put stuff in. We're cleaning up. Mm -hmm. okay. You know, again, they're trying to do positive, do positive, focus on. Don't go to the negative because they don't know how to change the negative. My thinking is, you ever watch the movie called Troy? Yes. You ever watch that movie? Great. It was a good movie, right? So here he is. He's in the tent with his girlfriend. This kid knocks on and said, hey, you're supposed to be in battle. So he gets his garb on. He goes out there. And he's just a little old five foot seven guy. And he's got this big, tall giant. Now, he has a really great skill. And he has this one spear. He runs up this guy. Boom. Giant falls down. It's all over. If you go to the cause of your problems, which is the memory, the trauma, the fears, the hurts, the movies you play in your mind, how your brother treated you, how your sister treated you, how your father and your mom, the accident that happened, the medical thing that occurred, you change that, it silences a lot of problems. Mm. You've got to get the big one. Now, again, if you're too afraid to get the big one, because you don't even know how to get the little one, much less the big one. You've got to learn how to drive yourself. You've got to know how your brain works. I'm going to teach you mechanically how you can change yourself. Mm -hmm. And I, by the way, it's a sad, it's a sad day in paradise that a healer can't heal themselves. What, what do you mean? Sorry, I don't know what you mean. That means they can help everybody else but themselves and yeah. they're falling yeah. apart. Right. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. you've got to know how to change you. And that's, you know, I, I have a level one training. It's called, you can change yourself mm -hmm. showing you how 
you can gain power and control over your life. A lot of these, a lot of these people who have had severe illnesses, like really bad illnesses is, um, they, they took my course, you know, you can change yourself. That's level one. And I'm going to show you how to do it. We're going to have you do practices. So you know how to change yourself. And then we have level two where you're going to help other people. Now you don't have to help anybody, but the good thing is you learn how the brain works. You're going to get free sessions all the way through your life will not be the same. Take a picture before you start. And in, in, in five years, four years, three years, however long it takes you to go through it, you will not be that same person. And one of the videos on there, we have all these girls up there. And one of them was taking 180 pills a day, fibromyalgia, ME, Lyme disease, uh, liver problems. I mean, her life was falling apart. And she was a minister. And she was, she, she, I mean, a chiropractor came to her home, did adjustments so you can get on the plane to come to Oklahoma. I pulled her up front. I pulled her up front and I cleaned up some major emotional issues in 45 minutes. The next day she was doing yoga for her husband and he was shocked wow. and, it, and it changed her. And what, but it didn't change everything by the way, because what she says, I shook the bottle and the, the pressure was in there because she's never dealt with her emotions. Mm. She ignored it. She pretended like it wasn't there. And what happened is those emotions started eating away at the body. Mm. Now you have to understand the body is not doing it to you. The body is responding to what you already hold inside you. It's innocent. You change the memories, your body's happier. If you, if you, go ahead. I was just gonna um, with with your course, uh, the the level one course. How how long is it? Like how uh, yeah, how many hours of content? That kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. Well, there's a. It's actually it's a it's an online course. We do live courses as well. Okay. Uh, it's it's all online. It's all videos. It's actually it was a seven day training course uploaded videos uh, you watch it on your home page you got several years to get it done there's no pressure but the most important thing is 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 do what works okay do okay. what works cool um, i mean i'm not here i mean listen people can work on themselves by watching my videos on yeah. youtube yeah not everything is there i have uh you can heal your body courses where you can see people with severe stuff and as we work through it, matter of fact, I do tap alongs every like I mean, we just finished every Tuesday and every Thursday from six to Oklahoma time from six to eight. Uh, we have people come in. We do different topics. One topic is, you know, trauma. Another topic is somebody in my family screwed me up. <laughs> we, we, you know, I think next week we'll show you how to, to redesign your life from inside your mind by using my concept called the happy journal. And how you can actually update your whole world by using that. So we do a lot of different things. The, the key is immerse yourself with something that works. Yeah. I mean, this is so logical and so direct. Yeah. Am amazing. Um, it, it, for someone who's listening to this right now, who's in kind of like their darkest hour. Uh, a lot of people who, you know, who are listening to this are desperate because they, they, they need some inspiration. Like, what would you say to these guys to like, you know, you know, cause they're, they're probably thinking, okay, it works for other people, but you know, I'm, there's something different wrong with me. I, I, there's something yeah, yeah. I haven't quite discovered about me. What would you say to yeah. that? Person? Uh, this is not a, this is a common story I hear all the time. I'm, I'm worse than anyone else. Everyone thinks that. I mean, seriously, everyone thinks that I'm the worst case ever. Nothing's ever worked for me. It's like the guy called me. He says, nothing's ever worked for me. And I said, okay, so what hasn't worked? So I said, I said, won't you do a list of everything that didn't work for you? So come, and he comes to my office. And so everything he did, it didn't work. I said, look how successful you are. Everything you tried, you successfully didn't work. You're doing something right inside you to make sure that you're successfully not making it work. The question is, why is that? And you know why it was? He says, I was the black sheep. I was the one that got blamed. I was the beaten. I was the one who that was the one who said, you'll never amount to anything. And you know what? He was trying to keep and maintain that belief system. Even though he said he wanted to heal, when he got to healing, he'd pack his bags and run mm. because it was violating his personal belief system. Mm. Wow. The mind's a screwed up thing isn't it <laughs> oh, it's, a, it's a it's an amazing manifester i mean to be ill 
And to be overweight and to have depression, to be sad, you have to work hard at it. <laughs> you have to have the right resources. You, I mean, I created the happy journal because people were coming to me and they were depressed. I go, well, how do you know you're depressed? I says, well, because I have stuff in my head. I said, well, can you think of those things? And said, oh, yeah, I got a lot of stuff. I said, um, do you have any happy memories? And you go, I know there's got to be something. So to be depressed, you got to think depressing things. You've got to have bad things handy. You've got to have a bleak world. You got to make sure that you watch and think and write the the right things to feel bad. Mm -hmm. God, you know, and I'd give them assignment, go home and write down 20 happy memories and they wouldn't do any of them. You know why? It screwed up their miserableness. So we had to break the identity attached to it. I think in terms of, like the questions I have, I think you've answered like all of them. I think it's so so interesting to me just because whenever people talk about trauma, I always just think it doesn't really apply to me because I think I was quite lucky. Uh, but I think what you're saying is I can act- I can actually pinpoint things in my childhood that I think could have been uh-huh. traumatic for me. So I think it's something I really do need to like properly delve deep into and have a look at. <laughs> people want to reach out to you guys like you as a company or I don't know, I, I don't, I know you're incredibly busy. I don't know whether you'd be able to answer questions or anything, but like how would people get in contact with, you know, you as a company, like how, how would they look you up? Well, again, uh, my website is, uh, you know, faster EFT uh-huh. skills to change. Uh, yeah. My name's Robert Jean, G E N E. You can look me up. You can find me. I'm all over the place. Um, but let me just say something about trauma. You don't have to be raped. You don't have to be beaten. You could have a car accident or you could have a bad school year. You could have a girlfriend who dumped you or, or a buddy who died. It could be nothing big or just the, the emotional environment, watching dad and mom fight. It doesn't have to be big. It could be something that angles your thinking about the world, angles your thinking about yourself. It could be something little. Again, you don't have to have a severe trauma. You could, and sometimes here's the weird thing is sometimes you have traumas and you don't even know it because your brain threw it behind the wall. So you can't see it. Yeah. Yeah. And that's really interesting to know. Uh, and yeah, quite horrifying as well, but. Um, but it, well, it is horrifying if you can't change it with yeah. us, we can change it. True, true. And um, look, thank you so much. Joe. I know you're a busy guy and uh, I know it's late where you are. So I really appreciate you, you, you know, you're sparing the time to, to come on. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, you've definitely uh, got my, the, the cogs turning for me. So I'm sure you mm-hmm. have a lot. And, and I know a lot of people will get a lot from this. So thank you so yeah. much for, for coming on and, and sharing this. Very good. So what you can do, guys, is just have them come and check my YouTube channel. And one thing I could leave the last message is yeah. learn how to like you from inside you. Learn how to like you by changing what is unpleasant within you. When you like yourself, you change the bad stuff within yourself, you set yourself free. And remember what you hold inside, you do to other people. Be nice to you first. And as you do that, it'll make a difference in the world. So you're not broken, there's nothing wrong with you, but it's time for a mental emotional update and your life and your health will be good. Check it out. That was one of the best sign offs we've had. So uh, I'll leave it at that point. Thank you so much, Robert. Very good. Thank you.